Welcome back to lab. If you've ever built a motor controller, power supply, or used a microcontroller, I'm betting that you've thought about capacitance at one point or another. What I hear most often when listening to others describe what a capacitor does is stabilize a voltage rail. Capacitors strive to make a voltage more constant. One of the big problems is that a real capacitor is never only a capacitor. Real capacitors are always a capacitor paired with its respective parasitic components. There's always a resistor and an inductor in series, making real capacitors less effective than their ideal counterparts. I suppose that brings us more to the point. How can we appropriately size, select, and implement capacitance to stabilize a DC link? This topic, DC link capacitance, is one of those things that seems really easy. On the surface, it seems like you can just grab any old capacitor off the shelf, throw it into a design, and boom! Done! Capacitance! Right? Well, I suppose you could do that. Uh, in fact, selecting capacitors without analysis may occasionally lead to making something that works for a little while. The difficult part of making a DC link is when you want it to work all the time, last for a long time, or both. If the goal is to create a DC link that will operate without fail for years, or if you want to build a couple thousand copies of your design and make sure that every single one will work, now we need to do some thinking. If I was only allowed to teach you one thing about capacitors, if I had to pick one fact that I think everyone should know about capacitors, it would be this. Your capacitor is not only a capacitor. Every real capacitor is actually a capacitor in series with an inductor and a resistor. That is why different types of capacitors exist. Electrolytic, polymer, tantalum, wet, dry, ceramic, film, double layer, all of these capacitor types are optimized for different things. Some of these capacitors are optimized for cost. Some of these have lower resistance, others may have lower inductance. Some of these can withstand higher voltages than others. Some are more convenient to create large value capacitors. If capacitors were perfect, there wouldn't be a need for all of these optimizations. There would just be a capacitor. Now with this in mind, there are a couple nuances that I think we should consider. Let's talk through some examples of what type of capacitor I might select for a particular situation. I think that'll help to guide you in your own selections. If I needed an amount of capacitance and I needed that value to be consistent over a long period of time, one cannot beat ceramic capacitors or multi-layer ceramic capacitors. These are basically a parallel plate capacitor made out of ceramic and metal. Once assembled, they're pretty hard to change unless they get physically damaged, like crushed or shaken off the board. They're metal plates spaced a distance apart. Like, there's nothing to dry out. It's ceramic. It's just physics. Because they're so grounded and the, and the construction is so simple, ceramic capacitors behave in a very consistent and repeatable way, but they're expensive and they can't achieve large capacitances at high voltages. Another important fact about multilayer ceramic caps is that they demonstrate up to an 80% reduction in their effective capacitance when the rated voltage is applied. What? A standard MLCC is pretty expensive for anything larger than a couple microfarads, but these parts start to transition from expensive to stupid expensive as the voltage rating and capacitance increases. This means that we might need to use many ceramic capacitors in series to get a job done, or supplement the ceramic capacitors with another technology to achieve the required capacitance. In this case, we're balancing the high performance of an MLCC with the cost effectiveness of other topologies. That said, if you need the absolute best capacitors money can buy, consistent performance for a long time or low series resistance, it's hard to beat an MLCC. Solid tantalum and aluminum polymer capacitors fall into similar buckets for me. These capacitors have lower ESR than lesser technologies, they're reasonably priced and can be found in larger values. Tantalum capacitors don't always last a long time, but these can get a little burninity. And what I mean by that is they can light on fire if abused or misused. Tantalums can stand in for a standard MLCC if trying to reduce cost, especially if low ESR isn't absolutely critical for your application. Film capacitors are great for high voltage applications. Once the bus voltage gets too high for efficient use of MLCCs, tantalum, or aluminum polymer caps, that's when I look to film. These have a relatively low ESR, though nowhere close to ceramic capacitors. Film capacitors can get a little spendy too, but they do perform well, and they fill a real technology gap for high voltage capacitors with low ESR. Aluminum electrolytic or electrolytic caps are, well, all over the place. 
These can range from 0.1 microfarads up to millifarads of capacitance with voltage ratings from 10 volts to a couple thousand volts. These are all over the map. It's hard to generalize a category of components that is so broad, but if I had to make three sweeping generalizations about electrolytic capacitors, here's what I would say. Electrolytic will probably be the cheapest, it'll probably have the highest resistance, and it will probably have the shortest operating life of the other technologies. They work for some applications, but a standard electrolytic capacitor just starts to dry out after a couple thousand hours. Electrolytic just doesn't work all the time. That was a rundown of a few different types of capacitors that are used quite often. Just know that there are more and I can't possibly speak to every application. Those were some sweeping generalizations and you'll have to do your own homework to pick the right technology for you. Designing capacitance for DC Link is very application specific, but I tried to provide some general truths that I think will help to guide you no matter what you're trying to do. Keep in mind that I'm trying to give the same advice to somebody who's putting capacitors near a microcontroller, building a switch mode power supply, designing a motor driver, and building a 2400 watt UPS all at the same time. The answer for each of you for each of these applications will be incredibly different. Shameless plug, I think this UPS project is awesome, so seriously check out our whole build playlist. Custom transformers to the nines, main connected power supplies, it's great, seriously, check this out. DC link capacitors then. Remember how I was saying that all real capacitors are capacitor, inductor, and resistor in series? Well, so are most things. Any wire or trace on a board has a resistor and an inductor in series. Every inductor and transformer have another resistor and inductor in series. Every two metal objects that are separated electrically and exist in the same universe has some mutual capacitance coupling them together. It just might be very, very small. The closer two objects are, the larger this capacitance becomes. What I'm trying to say is this. There's the circuit in your head, there are the components that are being intentionally placed on a printed circuit board, and then there's the circuit that you end up with. And those three things are not necessarily the same. It's important to carefully consider parasitic circuit elements because they are real. They really affect the performance of your system. In some applications, parasitic component values can be more important than the real ones, and they aren't going away. Parasitic components aren't going away today or ever. Let's focus on the resistor first. How does the parasitic resistor affect our capacitor? Well, when a capacitor is doing its job stabilizing voltage, current must be flowing into and out of that capacitor. Current is flowing into and out of this capacitor, which means that that same current must be going through the parasitic resistor. Why is this important? Well, it limits the peak current that can actually flow in and out of this capacitor. And I'm sure there's a more formal definition somewhere, but I'm going to challenge you to follow in my footsteps as we apply some basic truths of life the universe and everything to this situation. I'm also going to highlight one huge reason why I almost never use electrolytic capacitors. If current is flowing through a resistor, it's dissipating power. If we know that that resistor is dissipating power, we know that 100% of that power is converted into heat because a resistor does no real work. An electrolytic capacitor can commonly have a series resistance on the order of 200 milliohms or 0.2 ohms. And if we're trying to take a big capacitor, like a 220 microfarad capacitor, put this on the output of switching power supply, we're gonna find a problem real fast. I'd say that it's common to have a couple amps of ripple current. If we take a moment to consider what a couple amps of ripple current through 200 milliohms looks like, we're dissipating somewhere between half a watt and a watt in this part. Okay, what's the problem? Electrolytic capacitors have a liquid dielectric and they aren't terribly thermally conductive. This means that that watt will make them get pretty hot. To bring this home, what do you do when you want something to dry out faster? You heat it up. The fact that our electrolytic capacitor just turned itself into a one watt heater means that our capacitor is literally baking itself dry or destroying itself all the time. Bit by bit, moment by moment, our capacitor is drying itself out. If we push the envelope too far, we can actually boil the liquid inside the electrolytic capacitor, which leads to catastrophic failure. Long story short, electrolytic caps dry out, dissipate a lot of heat, and that heat causes them to dry out faster. I find that most electrolytic capacitors are rated with a lifetime between 2,000 hours and 10,000 hours. Now, 10,000 hours might sound like a lot until you divide by 24 and then 365. These parts are only rated to last between two and a half months and 12 years. It's not a very long time. 
and I don't want to be cracking up my power supplies or servicing my products every year to make sure the caps are still good. That's ridiculous. Basically, I only use electrolytic capacitors when I need to because I'll derate the capacitance by anywhere between 50 and 75% to make sure these things last a while. The only time I would really select an electrolytic capacitor for an application would be if I was putting down a capacitor that wouldn't have current flowing through it, and so if it doesn't have current flowing through it, it wouldn't be doing anything, I may as well just not put a capacitor there at all, save 50 cents. I like my electronics to last a while, okay? I don't see value in cheaping out on such a critical component. I'd rather save cost on an architecture level than cheap out on the component level. Let me just get off my soapbox for a moment and summarize the situation. An ideal capacitor doesn't dissipate power, but all real ones do. Capacitors with a liquid electrolyte can dry out due to the heat caused by this power, and we need to be careful not to push too much current into an electrolytic capacitor to prevent overstressing it. No matter what type of capacitor we're using, these all have a ripple current rating, so just look up the rating for your application and make sure you're under the line. Multiple capacitors can always be used in parallel to share the load if required. Inductance is next, and this gets a little tricky. It's hard for me to explain this one without going off the circuit design deep end, so just let me know in the comments if this doesn't make sense to you and I'll try to explain it in a different way with a follow-up video. Basically, there is a resonance structure inside the capacitor. There is an inductor and a capacitor in series, and at some particular frequency, energy will just start spontaneously sloshing around between the two components. This is what the self-resonant frequency is, and it's pretty important. The self-resonant frequency is important because that frequency is when the inductance of our capacitor starts to win. It starts to be the dominating behavior. Our capacitor starts to behave more like an inductor than a capacitor above this frequency. If you're building a power supply and want to put capacitors on the output, the self-resonant frequency becomes pretty important. The self-resonant frequency can mess with the control loop or render the output capacitance ineffective if you use a capacitor with too low of a self-resonant frequency for a converter that switches too fast. I prefer my capacitors to behave like capacitors, thank you very much. This information is always provided in the manufacturer datasheet for a cap. If you can't find the information you're looking for in the datasheet, try the website. Most manufacturers have great data available for all of their parts. I think that we still have a second, so let's take this time to walk through two examples, a low voltage high current design and a high voltage design. For lower voltages and higher currents, a lot of capacitance is typically required. Ceramic capacitors will have the low resistance and low inductance that you want, but it may take 300 capacitors to achieve the value required. Depending on the total quantity of capacitance required, this can go a few different directions, but I'd typically balance out the topology with enough MLCCs to take on most of the ripple current, then supplement that with some higher resistance and higher value capacitors to help out. This combination provides the high frequency responsiveness of an MLCC while managing cost and balancing compromises involved with other technologies. This hybrid technology using some ceramic plus something else is very common. 10 out of 10 would do works great. For higher voltages, less capacitance is required to achieve the same ripple performance. The reason why is simple. Energy stored in a capacitor is exponential with voltage. That means that a capacitor of the same value charged to 100 volts instead of 10 is storing 100 times more energy at the higher voltage. What this means is that a few microfarads of capacitance can get a lot of work done at these voltages. After all, 5% voltage ripple on a 400 volt bus is 20 volts. Dang, I like it. I'd typically use a film capacitor or electrolytic capacitor in this case, but a ceramic could technically work too if you don't really need much. DC link optimized film capacitors can achieve a couple millifarads of DC resistance, which is pretty good. It's not bad at all. Supplement a low ESR solution with a couple bulk electrolytic caps and, and we'll be in pretty good shape. I don't know if you picked up on this, but there isn't a lot of magic to considering a DC link because ultimately it's all about physics. We just need to have enough energy stored in capacitors and these need to have a low enough impedance, so small enough ESR and ESL to make sure that they're useful, that we can get that energy out when we need to. Ideally, these capacitors would last forever, and therefore the downstream circuit can function as intended for a long time too. If you feel like you learned something today and want more, consider subscribing to be notified of our future videos where we'll design the transformer responsible for boosting our battery voltage up to 300 volts and simulate the complete power module. If you'd like to support the channel, consider checking out the products that we featured today through our Amazon affiliate links in the description. 
it really helps us out a lot. I think that sizing a DC link and selecting the correct type of capacitor for an application is very important. If you think so too, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, showing us a picture of your DC link on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!